Welcome everybody to the Vatican Museum. Let's see if I'm going to be able to do this. We may have a drop in signal or in audio, so please let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, but today I'm going to give you a mini tour of the Vatican Museum. I've been a tour guide in Italy for 20 years, and in the days when I started as a tour guide, I did everything. I did all the tour guiding. Now we have local guides, but in the past, I used to love doing this, this tour. It was a highlight for me to be able to guide people through this museum and explain to them all of the art and the artifacts. And I'm really hoping that you'll join me today for a quick spin around here. I'll try to make it fast because this can last hours, of course, but I wanna give you a little sampler uh, in the Vatican Museum because it's really something I have always enjoyed doing and I haven't been able to do for a long time. So. I do hope you'll enjoy this. Please get comfortable, get your coffee. If you can't watch it all right now, that's fine. I'll try to download this and post it to my YouTube uh, channel as well later on. Uh, and we'll see, I may drop a signal as I said, but if I do, I'll try to get back with you as soon as I can. Uh, so shall we go? Andiamo. So what we're gonna do today is talk about the evolution of art. We're gonna talk about how art has changed over time and we're going to see the great collections of the Vatican Museum. Now, the Vatican Museum is essentially like the home of the Pope. Uh, it was in the past. This was built as a papal palace uh, in the mid kind of 1400s. That's when we, we see the Popes moving over here. And they actually used to live somewhere else. The Popes used to live at the Lateran Palace, which was across town. Uh, but in the Renaissance, they decided to fortify the Vatican Hill over here and turn this fortress into the actual palace of the Popes. So what you're gonna to see today in these galleries is that this was a home. This was the place the Pope lived. The Pope does not live here anymore. There are other papal apartments on the, the uh, site here and actually the current Pope doesn't live in those either. He lives in a cottage. Uh, but what you have left are the remnants of pretty amazing things. Uh, and something to note, this isn't a religious tour. I am Catholic, I am religious, but I'm going to be telling you stories and showing you things that are not exactly um, religious in, in origin necessarily. Uh, and you need to start off by realizing that some of the imagery you're going to see today is not religious and it might seem strange. Why are you going to see so many symbols of Roman emperors and power in the way that the Romans used to have it? Uh, and that is, an, is a topic we'll explore in just a few minutes. To start, I just want to take a really quick lap through the Pinacoteca and give you sort of a fast forward lesson in art history. So let's start here. So the Middle Ages was a time when art was very stiff. Uh, they actually had lived through a decree in the Middle Ages that you may not make people look like your relatives. They had to be kind of abstractions. But also, this particular piece of art speaks about Byzantine style. This is kind of a Byzantine style. If you remember those mosaics I showed you the other day, uh, you can see everything is very flat and really two-dimensional and almost cartoonish. Art went from being glorious in ancient Rome to being something this flat for a variety of complex reasons that I might cover in another talk, but I don't have time today. So if we go back to the 1200s, 1300s, this is what we see. And in religious art, what we see is the same thing always. We see something that was kind of predetermined. It wasn't where an artist could decide how they wanted to depict things, they were told. And always, you're going to have the same sorts of things. You'll have the, the saint, uh, and you'll have the symbols of the saint, so we know who it is. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is uh, Dominic, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, sorry, no. Do, do, do. Oh, St. Francis, actually. So usually there's something that tells you which one it is. This is St. Francis. Uh, and then around we have the, the, his life, a little bit of the story of his life. You can tell when you have figures like this Madonna over here. The background is gold and that's supposed to symbolize heaven. And you can see the beautiful sort of detail work that they did by hammering in patterns. Uh, this actually served a function beyond making the figures look like they were in heaven. It also provided a reflection for light. If you imagine all the churches did not have lighting in the past, they had to have something reflecting the lighting so this gold would actually sparkle. And you can imagine how impressive that might have been to people in the past. But the, the Mary here does not look like somebody you know. And the baby looks like a little Winston Churchill, like he does not look like anybody you know. Uh, and the people here are kind of out of scale. And that's because during this time, the important thing was to focus on the idea of Mary and not her humanity. Uh, the humanity aspect is something they lost, and this is a style called International Gothic. So that's where we're starting at today, 
is we're starting with some international Gothic pieces. Just so you can see the difference in what a short amount of time we have a huge thing. And that's why they call it the Renaissance, a huge uh, transition. So this particular piece here is 1371. And you can see again, we have the saints holding either the symbols of their martyrdom or the symbols of their faith with the Madonna in the middle. This is a very common sort of structure of an altarpiece from the Middle Ages. So 1300s, this is what we start with, International Gothic. And they called it that because no matter where you went in Europe, pretty much it all looked the same. It was kind of international. Uh, so, and then we have these funny little comic strips down here that tell us all of the details, okay? So we start there. So let's go ahead and move forward and we're gonna see some changes. So as time progresses towards the Renaissance, we start to have changes. We start to have more detail. Uh, there's more money because uh, Italy is becoming more prosperous. So they can hire artists who can really start to explore more things like, look at his knees. The knees are starting to pop up. And also this is not a Madonna. So that's interesting as well that we're focusing on St. Peter in this particular one. I know that because he's holding the keys, but look at the, the flowing of the cloak. So the faces are still comical in their way. They're kind of uh, illustrative, but they are moving slightly more towards something that is a little bit more realistic. So let's keep moving on. We, can, we don't want to get bogged down in international Gothic. We've got a lot to see. And here we start to see the evolution in the beginnings of the Renaissance, okay? So this one, do you see the, the architecture here? This is done by Filippo Lippi, who is one of my very favorite artists. Fra Filippo Lippi. Filippo Lippi is a funny one because he was a priest, uh, but he wasn't a priest by choice. He was a priest because he had no choice. Uh, he was like an orphan basically, and he was put into the priesthood, and he was an excellent painter, but he had, a, he liked to have models that were women, young women, uh, and he, he liked his women. So he got, when he was older, kind of middle-aged, he got a beautiful young nun to be a model for a lot of his paintings. And that woman eventually had Filipino Lippi. So they became lovers, they had a son. And the problem is that Filippo Lippi was so incredibly popular that what are they gonna do with him, you know? So what they did is they sort of quietly allowed Filippo Lippi and his lover to escape and uh, live on their own away from religious life. So kind of an incredible scandal for that time period. And we're talking about the early and mid 1400s. Lippi is one of my favorites though, because look at the gentleness of the colors, but the, the expressions of the faces. Uh, some of these are real portraits too. I mean, the man who's in the red, that looks like a real portrait. So this is a big departure and we're talking about a hundred year time span. All of a sudden we have people who can do architecture, they can do drapery, they can do faces, and why? Well, the why is hard to answer, but the basic reason, at least for the Florentine Renaissance, which is what we're speaking about, is money. Uh, the people back then had money and the merchants started spending money on churches and they would spend money on religious art because they were doing something they shouldn't. The Florentine merchants figured out how to loan money. And you may know that loaning money in the Catholic Church is illegal. So what do they do to try and get their get out of jail free card? They make chapels and they buy expensive art and they're hoping, hoping that it's enough, that they'll be able to get into heaven based on their contribution to the church. So that's what, it's a complicated thing and that's not the only reason, but that's one of the, the big reasons. So moving more into the Renaissance, we have some very famous images in here. So this is from the mid to late 1400s, Music Making Angels, and it's by Melozzo degli Ambrosi. Da Forli is the other way he's known. This is a kind of sad series of frescoes because this series of frescoes was in a church. And that church was demolished. So these were all taken from the walls of a church. You, if you ever bought a Christmas calendar or Christmas cards, this is the angel you've probably seen. You probably didn't know that she was a, a, a fresco, a poor lonely little fresco fragment in the Vatican Museum, but uh, they're beautiful musician angels. Again, if you saw my uh, tour yesterday of the chapel in Orvieto, the San Rizzo Chapel, you know that 
fresco is unusual because it's plaster and it's painted with pigments that soak into the plaster. So it's possible to save a fresco by ripping it off the walls and then remounting it, which is what they've done here. And over here, we have another one. This is also another uh, fragment of a fresco by the same artist. And this is Sisto the Fourth, Pope Sixtus the Fourth. So all the same artist. But look how, how far we've come. Now we're in the late 1400s and people have learned architecture. Look at that. They've learned perspective. Brunelleschi is going to be one of the first people to teach how to do these, these tricks with the architecture. And he's the, the great architect who did the Dome of Saint, or of uh, the Duomo of Florence. Okay, so really fast forward here. We're getting into the main Renaissance. So the main Renaissance is going to be late 1400s into the 1500s. We have some very pretty Botticelli-esque paintings. Lippi, by the way, who I showed you earlier, was one of the teachers and inspirations of Botticelli. And here we have a confusing space because we're still a little bit stuck in the past, aren't we? We're stuck a little bit still with the international Gothic style. We haven't been able to break away from it, but you can see. Okay, sorry I lost you for just a moment. So now we're in the Raphael galleries. So Raphael is going to, he lives at the end of the 1400s, beginning of the 1500s. He's active mostly in the early 1500s and he's the great rival of Michelangelo. Handsome and well-liked, he was from Le Marche, Urbino, and he came to the Vatican as a very heralded young talented artist and he worked on a variety of projects here. These are tapestries that were made actually after he died. So there are cartoons, there are drawings of them in London, but these are very famous tapestries that were all designed by him. But what he is the master of, and you'll see in just a second, these tapestries are just beautifully, beautifully displayed in here. And I don't, I've never been in here when it's empty. This is just marvelous. So here's where we have some of the most beautiful Raphael work. And what I love is that what we have displayed here are things that kind of show you different ages. So this is early, sorry, this one here is early 1500s, 1504, the coronation of the Virgin. So this is early in his career. And what I want you to look at is how sweet Raphael is. Look how sweet the faces are. They're, they're gentle, the bodies are long and lean. The colors are beautiful. You have a little bit of that Leonardo-inspired sfumato, which is that uh, sort of haze in the distance. So he's learning from everybody, but he's bringing something new to the table, which is a gentleness and an appreciation for beauty. And Raphael is really the master of this sort of sweetness and gentleness and light. Look how sweet Jesus looks. And all the little babies, the seraphim up there. He's got all, he's got everything. He's got the whole package. He's got color, he's got expression. He's doing some portraits. You can see some of those men and you can see him. I'm pretty sure that's him right there. Yeah, he was a good looker. He was known for partying and had lots of girlfriends and he didn't have parties while he was painting. He led a life that was exactly the opposite of Michelangelo. So this is before he encountered Michelangelo. This is his style. Very beautiful, kind of the height of easygoing Renaissance beauty, right? But then he comes to the Vatican Museum and he meets somebody new. He meets Michelangelo. For a while, it is said, I mean, and this could be a tour guide story, it's said though that when Raphael arrived here, he and Michelangelo really detested each other and Michelangelo locked himself in the Sistine Chapel and wouldn't let anybody see what he was working on. Of course, everybody thought it was because he was terrible. He was, he didn't know how to do fresco. They thought he was failing and that's why he wouldn't let anybody in. So the story is that Raphael took the keys to the Sistine Chapel and went in late at night to see what kind of art 
Michelangelo was doing, and he left there in awe because he changed his style. So let's look back here again, look at the long, lean Madonnas and saints. Now have a look, he's changed. Look at this woman with this Herculean body. I don't think any, any amount of Pilates is gonna turn me into that kind of a person. He still has beautiful, beautiful faces. There is a gentleness to his work still, the same beauty, but he's gone with this Superman, overly muscular look that Michelangelo really prefers. So this is something very different. Hmm? And then the colors, look at the colors, the jewel tones. These jewel tones are really characteristic of Michelangelo, right? So this is the, uh, the Transfiguration. And the Transfiguration I showed you actually uh, a couple days ago. This was supposed to be in St. Peter's on the altar, but then they took it down and they replaced it with a mosaic. And this is the original, Raphael's Transfiguration. This was done in 1518-ish, 1520. So about 20 years after this, a little less. So that's the difference between his work. He matures as an artist, but he's also affected by the coming of a new style of art, which is called Mannerism. So that's what's gonna happen after the Renaissance. We're gonna have a new style called Mannerism, where uh, after you get to Michelangelo, how do you improve, or Raphael, and the way they improve is by exaggerating. And that's where we get the style called Mannerism. Okay, and now we are in for a real treat. This is something not a lot of people know. But here we have a Da Vinci. And I love this painting because in this room, people, 90% of the visitors to the Vatican Museum walk right by here. And they never take a look at this one. This is St. Jerome, San Girolamo. And St. Jerome was a hermit and he lived in the desert. Uh, this is typical of the Leonardo style because it's not done. He never really finished anything. But you can see his sketch if you see the lion that's only partially done there. And you can see he started on the sky. But even if it's not done, it still has a really specific power that's very interesting because it sort of has a, a modern edge to it. Look at over in this little corner I can zoom in here. You can see that he planned to put some sort of like maybe a facade of a Florentine church in the background there. But of course, the most important thing about this work is look at the body. This is the body of an old man. And how did he know what the body of an old man looked like? So perhaps he dissected. Uh, we know for sure Michelangelo did do that. But all of the details are so absolutely perfect. And we again got that same sfumato. There's the sfumato if you see that. It's just very cloudy in the background there, hazy. So this is Da Vinci, and again, this is 1482, so we are 20 years before Raphael is going to burst onto the scene. Uh, but nobody really ever paints like Da Vinci again. There are very few Da Vinci paintings available to see anywhere because he didn't finish stuff. Oh, hey, there's a Bellini here. This is a little bit off topic, but this is Venetian Renaissance. This is later. This is in the... Uh, kind of mid, well, early 1500s. The, the thing about Bellini is that he um, was from Venice and the Venetians interpret the um, Renaissance in a very different way. They're all about drama and light, drama and light. Bellini is the one, of course, that you know the cocktail from. They named the cocktail after him. But they did that because he always had a very particular color of skin that everyone really liked. Okay, I don't want to bog you down too much with this, and actually what I might do is cut uh, and rejoin in the museum itself so we can make these two separate videos. But here we have later work, and again, this is gonna be more Mannerist. This is St. George and the Dragon. Because what happens after Michelangelo? How do you compete? The way you compete is you go a little bit crazy. This is Titian, and Titian is the Venetian Michelangelo. Bellini is sort of an earlier painter, but Titian is a little bit later. But Titian is um, important and interesting because he paints in a style that is as beautiful as Michelangelo and also with colors, but have a look at how blurry it looks. If I zoom in here, 
you can see that there are no edges. There are only shades and shadows. And if you compare that to Lippy that we saw earlier, Lippy was like an illustration. There were lines around everything. But every time I look at a Titian, I always feel like I need to check my glasses because my glasses are a little blurry, but it's not. It's that he is a painter of shade and shadow and light. And that's really what Venice is about, the Venetian school of art. Look at the fabric, it looks real, but if you kind of go in, it, it doesn't look like anything. So I kind of consider Titian to be one of the first impressionists in a sense. So that's Tiziano, Titian from Venice. This is a doge from Venice. If you've ever been to Venice, this was the Duke. And this was also a, Ven a, a Titian. And look how fine his cloak is. The doge was the leader of Venice, but he actually was um, not a king. He was elected. He was chosen by his peers, the other family members, uh, or famous families of Venice. They chose somebody. And the doge typically was elected at a very advanced age because it was a job for life. Once you were elected doge, you were doge for life. So they'd always elect people who were like 90. So the term of office would be controllable. So, okay those crafty Venetians. Oh, this is so amazing, you guys. I was so tired before, I didn't think I'd be able to do this because I wanted to go take a nap. I kept telling Mountain I was ready for a nap. But I've never seen anything like this. I wish I had my sketchbook. I would have just come here all day and painted and sketched. Beautiful. Oh, this is lovely. Il Barocci. So this is later. This is going to going into more Baroque style art, where we go a lot more colorful and there's lots of lovely fat ladies. You can always tell Baroque art by how fat the ladies are if they're fat and pale. Oh, and then we go into the chiaroscuro. This is going to be a style ushered in by Caravaggio. So we're skipping ahead to the 1600s when people start to love light and dark. And here over here we have probably the most famous Caravaggio in existence. Now Caravaggio was an interesting character. Um, he was a very talented painter and he's sort of the Michelangelo of the 1600s, so the most famous painter of Rome in that time. Uh, the thing with him though is that he was not a well-behaved individual. Uh, he loved to go out and drink in bars, he loved to hang out with people who were maybe not high society, and he used those people as his subjects. So he's known for two things. Number one, chiaroscuro, light and dark contrast. So if you see, it's like a stage set. There's nothing in the back. We don't see any scenery because it's black, and that really highlights the color of the flesh. And he's so good at doing the color of the flesh. We can tell that Christ is dead because that looks like a dead body. It's kind of green. It's so, it's like hyper-realistic almost. And the hyper-reality is highlighted by the fact that it's black in the background. So we're looking at a stage set. There's all kinds of strange details always put into these. They're standing on something that looks like a tomb, could be. And then the other strange detail is who the subjects well, not the subjects, the models were. What he often used were corpses that were found in the morgues. And also the women that he used and the, the people, a lot of these people were prostitutes or, you know, peasants. Uh, the, the people he used for saints were well-known gamblers or, you know, people who did not have good reputations. And his point was an important one, and that was that the apostles and the saints were regular people. We see them as glorified perfection, something to strive for, but in reality, they were normal people like us. So in a way, I appreciate his point of view because all the people, the characters in the Bible, when they were real people, were real people with flaws. And in that way, it's humanizing the stories of the Bible. So that's what I appreciate about Caravaggio. Of course, it was very scandalous to do that sort of thing and to show cleavage. He usually shows women with big busts. 
um, but he lived an unfortunate life. He ended up dying mysteriously. He got in a bar fight and got exiled to Malta. Then he was in Sicily for a while, and on his way back to Rome, he died on a beach near Naples mysteriously. So lots of intrigue. If you want a book about um, him, I can certainly recommend one for you. Okay, so that's our little quick spin through art uh, here at the Pinacoteca. And this is just later stuff. We're getting into more Rococo style, which some people like, but doesn't really float my boat too much. Yeah, lots of pictures of dead animals, and yeah, that's Rococo for you. The flowers are pretty, but still lifes. They love still lifes in the 1700s, but not exactly my cup of tea. so many pieces of art that we could stand in front of and we could do each one individually but today we're just doing a little quick survey okay so that ends part one of our tour of the vatican museum i'm going to go ahead and take a quick five minute break and get some water and then i will stream a, a subsequent tour uh, starting again in the cortile de la pina where i'll talk to you a little bit about the evolution of the papacy and the symbols that we see throughout the Vatican Museum. Okay, so stick around if you'd like more from the Vatican Museum. This is just the aperitivo going into the Pinacoteca. And actually, in fact, I rarely bring my groups into the Pinacoteca, uh, but I thought today there's nobody here, so why not take that opportunity? Okay, so ci vediamo fra poco. Take five, everybody, go refill your coffee cup or your wine glass. It's a pandemic, man. If it's eight o'clock in the morning, it's, it's time for a glass of wine somewhere. So uh, I'll be back with you. Get your popcorn out, there you go. And we'll continue on with our tour of the Vatican Museum here on Adventures with Sarah. Ciao, ciao, ciao.